my introduction to classical music really came through Fife and Drum Corps. A lot of the tunes, some of which we're going to play for you, uh, were 17th century, 18th century tunes. And this is the same, this music comes from the same place musically where Haydn and Mozart and Bach were writing their music. Bach and Mozart wrote loads of little minuets and short dance movements. Those are more artistic variations on the common dance music of the day. And that's what we play on the fifes and drums. You can find the Buddhist drum and fife corps, which is our oldest continuously active corps in Connecticut, has some music floating around that they play. They, oh, my grandfather taught me this one. You find out that those tunes are 200 years old, 300 years old. They've been playing them in those towns ever since. So if you're interested in classical music, a wonderful way to get used to the kind of phrase and the kinds of tonality that are used, you grow up in a fife and drum corps, you hear these tunes to play. So one of the things that I've gotten from Fife and Drum Corps is my introduction to classical music. Sometimes people I know who aren't from this area say, well, why would you ever do that? What are Fife's and Drums about? They don't have too much of an idea. So I thought that the most uh, articulate person who could explain this sort of thing would be William Shakespeare, who wrote about Fife's and Drums a little bit. I want to give you a couple of little examples of how Shakespeare saw it. Merchant of Venice, he has, I'm trying to set this up for you very briefly, Shylock is a Jewish money lender, and he's pretty wealthy, but he's living in a Jewish ghetto, and he uh, is very concerned about his daughter Jessica, that she not hang around with the wrong kind of people. Needless to say, a good example that Shakespeare can give of the wrong kind of people are fighters and drummers. <laughs> so, in this uh, excerpt, you have to know a couple of things aren't immediately apparent. A mask spelled with a Q-U-E, that's a kind of celebration. It's a kind of a musical play performance. There'd be drama and play acting and music and a night's entertainment is a mask. And also uh, casement windows, when you refer to casements, you refer to big windows that uh, the whole window opens up directly as opposed to our, our modern kinds of windows. So when he refers to casements, he's talking about opening the windows for the house. So Shylock is about to go out for the evening, and he's warning his daughter to stay away from these bad people in the street. In other words, the pipers and drummers and the people who listen to them. Shylock says, what? Are there masks? Hear you me, Jessica. Lock up my doors, and when you hear the drum, and the vile squeaking of the wry neck fight, clamber not you up to the casement then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces. But stop my house's ears, I mean my casements. Let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. So his point here is that the pipes and drums and all of this wild drunken partying is something to keep your daughter away from. So shortly after this time, in 1660, Rembrandt von Rijn, uh, at least one of the three or four most famous artists of, uh, of European history, made a famous painting uh, of a militia company. And uh, for the book, we got the rights from the, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam to reproduce it. So these are very wealthy Dutch burgers, middle class people uh, who have nominally, it's called, it's famously called the Night Watch, that wasn't Rembrandt's name for it, but uh, these guys would be in charge of protecting the city of Amsterdam at night. People dressed like that are not wandering the streets at 2 o'clock in the morning saying that all's well, but they would be in charge of it. It's an important ceremonial position. And over in the corner, there's the drummer with a very large drum, and the drum sitting next to you is a, a replica of that drum. <coughs> and you can see the playing technique and that look of uh, avid musicality on his face. <laughs> that, uh, none of that's really changed. So this painting is from 1660, and you can see that the drum is an important ceremonial instrument, and also used. Um, the last little reading I want to do series of reading uh, is about this. In the early days of New England, so Connecticut is being settled at just this time. In 1660, when this painting was done, uh, Connecticut is already has several towns in it. 
And if you think about it, the first 10 or 20 years that you're settling New England, coming from Europe, you're really limited in what you're going to bring with you. Um, and you're limited in what is available to you. People in New England, as late as the time of the Revolution, people in New England never saw a cathedral. They never saw a castle. There were none. And they never heard a church bell. Because a big church bell is very, very heavy. If you've ever been up to Plymouth and seen the Mayflower II, the reproduction of the ship on which the Pilgrims sailed, not a very big ship. Uh, they only fit about 120 colonists on that ship. So you don't have room for very much. You need to signal. People don't have clocks. People don't have bells. A drum doesn't take up that much room, and you can put a lot of stuff inside it. You can take off the heads and just use the shell as a, as a carton. And that's what they brought with them in the earliest settlements. In the early days, before bells were hung in church belfries, and when clocks were extremely rare, all of the town events were usually regulated by the beating of the drums. A drummer was an important functionary in the town and a paid employee. For instance, soon after the early Connecticut town of Wallingford was established in 1670, its town meeting voted that Jeremiah Howe have 40 shillings allowed him for beating the drum, Sabbath days and other days. On the Sabbath, it was required that you couldn't have a town in New England. You couldn't have a legal township if you didn't have a congregational church in the town. It was one of the requirements to have a township. And it was also required that you attend church or explain the reason why. You'd be fined for not attending the church services. And if nobody has a watch, and it's Sunday morning to get people to the service at the right time, there would be a town drummer who would walk around the town beating the drum. And in the days before all the noise that we're used to having in our environment, you'd hear a drum from a pretty long distance. People from the Buddhist drum, who I've read this many times and heard older people say it would happen, you could play the drums in Buddhist and hear it across the river in Indian. Uh I've heard that from a lot of people, and I believe it. If you take away all the sounds we're used to hearing, the jet planes going overhead and all the automobiles and everything that goes along with it. So in the early days of New England, people would be uh, playing these drums, and that was a way to make communication in the town. When they got church bells, the drums changed to, to different purposes. Uh, the last little excerpt before we, we play a little something for you goes like this. As you, you may know the story of the Charter Oak in Connecticut, that story runs roughly like this. Uh, during the reign of the last Stuart King, James II, people in New York who were closely allied with the king thought it would be great if they could take over Connecticut too, or at least the parts of Connecticut they wanted. So Connecticut had its own charter, which they tried to take away. As long as we had our own charter, uh, the king couldn't do anything to us. We had a legal right to have our own state. So there's the, the story of the charter all these guys from New York came, and uh, somebody opened the door to make all the candles go out, took our charter, and hid it in an oak tree up in Hartford, so that the New York people couldn't steal it. Uh, so they went back to New York and kept plotting against us. But when they came back again, the idea was this, they were going to take over our state militia. So that's the setting for this. The Trumbull family, a very famous family in the history of Connecticut, in 1818, Benjamin Trumbull wrote uh, a history of Connecticut, and he tells this story. And I was rather, I was just reading through the book, and I was pleasantly surprised to see how important the drums were in this. The people from New York are there in Hartford, ready to make the announcement that the Connecticut militia is now under the command of New York commanders, which effectively means we couldn't defend ourselves against anything New York wanted to do. The train bands, a train band is a militia company, train band, bands of men who are trained in military techniques, precursor to the National Guard. The train bands of Hartford assembled and, as the tradition is, this is what Trumbull wrote, while Captain Wadsworth, the senior officer, was walking in front of the companies and exercising the soldiers, Colonel Fletcher ordered his commission and instructions to be read. Captain Wadsworth instantly commanded, beat the drums, and there was such a roaring of them that nothing else could be heard. Colonel Fletcher commanded silence, but no sooner had Bayard 
from New York, made an attempt to read again, and Wadsworth commands, drum, drum, I say. The drummers understood their business and instantly beat up with all the art and life of which they were master. Silence, silence, says the colonel. No sooner was there a pause than Wadsworth speaks with great earnestness. Drum, drum, I say. And turning to his excellency said, if I am interrupted again, I will make the sun shine through you in a moment. He spoke with such energy in his voice and meaning in his countenance that no further attempts were made to read or enlist men. Such numbers of people collected together and their spirits appeared so high that the governor of New York in his suit judged it expedient soon to leave the town and return to New York. So, so you wouldn't have a Connecticut today if it wasn't for us drummers. <laughs>
I don't think we can go through every page of that. But on the cover here, this is a picture, a fairly early picture of the Modus Drum and Fife Corps that was organized in 1860, the year that Abraham Lincoln was elected president. I don't think that's an accident. All sorts of quasi-military units were starting up in order, because we knew that there would be a mass mobilization and there would be a war coming. I don't like wars very much. I don't think they're fun or happy or healthy events. But fights and drums are clearly tied up with this. So I'm not, I'm not trying to portray this as, isn't this fun in games? We get to have half a million people killed. I don't think it's that much fun. But uh, it's, a, it's a big part of this, and it's obviously a big part of American history. So this was the, this is the earliest picture. This is probably taken during the Civil War in Buddhists. Uh, my, my late father and my aunt have told me that they know the exact location in Buddhists where this uh, picture was taken. But you can see they look pretty full of business. That's our first fife and drum corps in Connecticut that still continuously active and plays pretty much the same repertory they played at that time. And that was already an old repertory. Throughout the Civil War, there's a lot of fife and drum activity. I want to try to bring us up to our fife and drum course now and we'll play you some music. This style that these people played was an older style that harkens back to the days of the Revolution and probably before that, the music that was used in the militia. Just last weekend, our group, my lovely, lovely group, played in, in Moodus. They have a drum corps muster. We heard the Moodus drum and fife corps play. They still play the same music they played that was already old fashioned in 1860. Uh, they play that today. They played it since. They're very, very proud of that. And, and so are we. And I think people in Connecticut ought to be. It's not too many areas of the country that have uh, cultural traditions that are 200 years old. They can trace their, their origins back to before 1820. That's a long time to be doing the same thing on a volunteer basis in a small town in the Connecticut River Valley. And the people in Moose have been doing that really, really well for all that time. There was a more modern style that came in at the time of the Civil War. As you know, the middle 1800s, Industrial Revolution, factory workers, lots of immigration, new people moving into the country from different areas, uh, and the whole tempo of life was picking up a lot. And I'd like the group now, we're going to play you a couple of numbers, Civil War style pieces. Some are exactly Civil War pieces. I'd like to give you an idea of what fights and drums did during the Civil War. These are the two tunes most associated uh, with the Confederacy. Bonnie Blue Flag became a kind of national anthem for them. And Dixie, as you know, was a, uh, a piece from the early minstrel shows. It was written a few years before the war, but because of the lyrics, as you know, glorify the uh, living on the plantations in the South, it was uh, associated with the, with the South. The composer, Dan Emmett, uh, who wrote Dixie, this might be of interest to you if you don't already know the story, the man who wrote Dixie, this very, very famous tune, uh, was, among other things, a fifer and drummer. And during the war, his job was to teach the fifers and drummers for the United States Army. And they worked on Governor's Island in New York Harbor. And during the day, Dan Emmett's job, as, as a freelance musician, myself for most of my life, I can tell you, you, when you're a musician and somebody offers you money to do something musical, you say, thank you very much. When would you like me to be there? Uh, so during the day, Dan Emmett's job was to be on Governor's Island teaching people how to play fife and drum music. During the nighttime, he got on the ferry and went into Manhattan and the uh, minstrel shows, uh, the most famous minstrel band at the time he was associated with, uh, and at, he was a composer for them and sometimes a performer with them. So he was in New York playing the, the banjo and singing and doing comedy routines and just listening to the show to see what he would write next for them at the nighttime. Then he got on the ferry and go back the next day and teach people how to play tunes like this. And at the night, he'd go back in. And that's how he made his living during the Civil War. So we'll play these two tunes for you. Uh,